17. Luigi, a socialist, since everyone here has stated their opinion, allow me to state mine? These are just some of my own ideas, and I don't want to expose myself to the combined intolerance of the bourgeoisie and the anarchists. Giorgio, I am amazed that you speak like that. Since we are both workers we can, and must, consider ourselves friends and comrades, but you seem to believe that anarchists are the enemies of socialists. On the contrary, we are their friends, their collaborators. Even if many notable socialists have attempted and still attempt to oppose socialism to anarchism, the truth is that, if socialism means a society or the aspiration for a society in which humans live in fellowship, in which the well-being of all is a condition for the well-being of each, in which no one is a slave or exploited and each person has the means to develop to the maximum extent possible and to enjoy in peace all the benefits of civilization and of communal work, not only are we socialists, but we have the right to consider ourselves the most radical and consistent socialists. After all, even Signor Ambrogio, who has sent so many of us to jail, knows we were the first to introduce, to explain, and to propagate socialism, and if little by little we ended up abandoning the name and calling ourselves simply anarchists, it was because there arose alongside us another school, dictatorial and parliamentary, which managed to prevail and to make of socialism such a hybrid and accommodating thing that it was impossible to reconcile with our ideals and our methods a doctrine. That was repugnant to our nature. Luigi, in fact, I have understood your arguments and we certainly agree on many things, especially the criticisms of capitalism. But we, we don't agree on everything, firstly because anarchists only believe in revolution and renounce the more civilized means of struggle that have replaced those violent methods which were perhaps necessary once upon a time, and secondly, because even if we should conclude with a violent revolution, it would be necessary to put in power a new government to do things in an orderly manner and not leave everything to arbitrary actions and the fury of the masses. Giorgio. Well, let's discuss this further. Do you seriously believe that it is possible radically to transform society, to demolish privileges, throw out the government, expropriate the bourgeoisie without resorting to force? I hope that you don't delude yourself that owners and rulers will surrender without resistance, without making use of the forces at their disposal, and can somehow be persuaded to play the part of sacrificial victims. Otherwise, ask these gentlemen here who, if they could, would get rid of you and me with great pleasure and with great speed. Luigi, no, I don't have any of those illusions. But since today the workers are the great majority of the electorate and have the right to vote in administrative and political elections, it seems to me that, if they were conscious and willing, they could without too much effort put in power people whom they could trust, socialists and, if you want, even some anarchists, who could make good laws, nationalize the land and workshops and introduce socialism. Giorgio, of course, if the workers were conscious and committed. But if they were developed enough to be able to understand the causes of their problems and the remedies to them, if they were truly determined to emancipate themselves, then the revolution could be made with little, or no, violence, and the workers themselves could do whatever they wanted and there wouldn't be a need to send to parliament and into government people, who, even if they didn't allow themselves to become intoxicated and corrupted by the allurements of power, as unfortunately happens, find themselves unable to provide for social needs and do what the electors expect of them. But unfortunately the workers, 
or the great majority of them, are not conscious or committed, they live in conditions that do not admit of the possibility of emancipating themselves morally unless there is firstly an improvement in their material condition. So, the transformation of society must come about through the initiative and the work of those minority groups who due to fortunate circumstances have been able to elevate themselves above the common level, numerical minorities which end up being the predominant force capable of pulling along with them the backward masses. Look at the facts, and soon you will see that, precisely because of the moral and material conditions in which the proletariat finds itself, the bourgeoisie and the government always succeed in obtaining from the parliament what suits them. That's why they concede universal suffrage and allow it to function. If they should see any danger of being legally dispossessed they would be the first to depart from legality and violate what they call the popular will. Already they do this on every occasion the laws by mistake work against them. Luigi. You say this, but in the meantime we see the number of socialist deputies is always increasing. One day they will be the majority and... Giorgio, but, can't you see that when socialists enter parliament, they immediately become tamed and, from being a danger, they become collaborators, and supporters of the prevailing order? After all, by sending socialists to parliament we render a service to the bourgeoisie because the most active, able and popular people are removed from the heart of the masses and transported into a bourgeoisie environment. Furthermore, as I've already told you, when the socialist members of parliament really become a danger, the government will drive them from parliament at bayonet point and suppress universal suffrage. Luigi, it may seem like this to you, because you always see things in terms of a world in extreme crisis. The reverse is true. The world moves a little at a time by gradual evolution. It is necessary for the proletariat to prepare to take over from the bourgeoisie, by educating itself, by organizing itself, by sending its representatives to the bodies which decide and make laws, and when it becomes mature it will take everything into its own hands, and the new society to which we aspire will be established. In all civilized countries the number of socialist deputies is increasing and naturally so too is their support among the masses. Some day they will certainly be the majority, and if then the bourgeoisie and its government will not give in peacefully and attempts violently to suppress the popular will, we will reply to violence with violence. It is necessary to take time. It is useless and damaging wanting to try to force the laws of nature and of history. Giorgio, dear Luigi, the laws of nature do not need defenders, they produce respect for themselves. People laboriously discover them and make use of their discovery either to do good or evil, but beware of accepting as natural laws the social facts that interested parties, in our case the economists and sociologists who defend the bourgeoisie, describe as such. As far as the laws of history, they are formulated after history is made. Let us first of all make history. The world moves slowly, or quickly, it goes forward or backward, as the result of an indefinite number of natural and human factors, and it is an error to feel confident of a continuous evolution which always moves in the same direction. At present it is certainly true that society is in a continuous, slow evolution, but evolution in essence means change, and if some changes are those that lead in the right direction for us, that favor the elevation of humanity towards a superior ideal of community and of liberty, others instead reinforce the existing institutions or drive back and annul the progress already realized. While people remain in opposition to each other, no gains are secure, no progress in social organization can be considered definitely one. We must utilize and encourage all the elements of progress and combat, obstruct and try to neutralize regressive and conservative forces.
Today the fate of humanity depends on the struggle between workers and exploiters and whatever conciliation there is between the two hostile classes, whatever collaboration there is between capitalists and workers, between government and people, carried out with the intention or on the pretext of toning down social disputes, only serves to favor the class of oppressors, to reinforce the tottering institutions and, what is worse still, to separate from the masses the most developed proletarian elements and turn them into a new privileged class with an interest shared with the barons of industry, finance, and politics, in maintaining the great majority of the people in a state of inferiority and subjection. You talk, talk of evolution, and seem to think that necessarily and inevitably, whether people want it or not, humanity will arrive at socialism, in other words a society created for the equal interest of all, in which the means of production belong to all, where everybody will be a worker, where everybody will enjoy with equal rights all the benefits of civilization. But this is not true. Socialism will come about if the people want it and do what is necessary to achieve it. Because otherwise it is possible that, instead of socialism, a social situation could eventuate in which the differences between people are greater and more permanent, in which humanity becomes divided into two different races, the gentlefolk and the servants, with an intermediate class which would serve to ensure through the combination of intelligence and brute force, the dominance of one over the other. Or there could simply be a continuation of the present state of continuous struggle, an alternation of improvements and deteriorations, of crises and periodic wars. Actually, I would say that if we were to leave things to their natural course, evolution would probably move in the opposite direction to the one we desire, it would move towards the consolidation of privileges, towards a stable equilibrium established in favor of the present rulers, because it is natural that strength belongs to the strong, and who starts the contest with certain advantages over their opponent will always gain more advantages in the course of the struggle. Luigi, perhaps you are right, this is precisely why we need to utilize all the means at our disposal, education, organization and political struggle. Giorgio, all means, yes, but all the means that lead to our goal. Education, certainly. It is the first thing that is needed, because if we don't act on the minds of individuals, if we don't awaken their consciences, if we don't stimulate their senses, if we don't excite their will, progress will not be possible. And by education I don't so much mean book learning, although, it too is necessary, but not very accessible to proletarians, rather, the education that one acquires through conscious contact with society, propaganda, discussions, concern with public issues, the participation in the struggles for one's own and others' improvement. This education of the individual is necessary and would be sufficient to transform the world if it could be extended to all. But, unfortunately, that is not possible. People are influenced, dominated, one could almost say shaped, by the environment in which they live, and when the environment is not suitable one can progress only by fighting against it. At any given moment there are only a limited number of individuals who are capable, either because of inherited capacities or because of specially favorable circumstances, of elevating themselves above the environment, reacting against it and contributing to its transformation. This is why it is a conscious minority that must break the ice and violently change the exterior circumstances. Organization, a great and necessary thing provided that it is used to fight the bosses and not to reach an agreement with them. Political struggle, obviously, provided by it we mean struggle against the government and not cooperation with the government. Pay close attention. If you want to improve the capitalist system and make it tolerable, and hence sanction and perpetuate it, then certain accommodations, certain amounts of collaboration may be acceptable but if you truly want to overthrow the system, then you must clearly place yourself outside and against the system itself.
And since the revolution is necessary and since whichever way you look at it the problem will only be solved through revolution, don't you think we should prepare ourselves from now on, spiritually and materially, instead of deluding the masses and giving them the hope of being able to emancipate themselves without sacrifices and bloody struggles? Luigi, that's fine. Let's suppose that you are right and that revolution is inevitable. There are also a lot of socialists who say the same. But it will always be necessary to establish a new government to direct and organize the revolution. Giorgio, why? If among the masses there isn't a sufficient number of revolutionaries, manual and non-manual workers, capable of providing for the needs of the struggle and of life, the revolution will not be made, or if made, will not triumph. And if a sufficient number exist what is a government good for other than to paralyze popular initiative and in substance to choke the very revolution itself? In fact, what can a parliamentary or a dictatorial government do? It must first of all think of and ensure its own existence as a government, in other words establish an armed force to defend itself against its opponents and to impose its own will on recalcitrants, then it would have to inform itself, study, try to conciliate the wills and the interests in conflict and hence make laws, which most likely will not please anybody. In the meantime it is necessary to go on living. Either property will have de facto passed into the hands of the workers, and then, because it is necessary to provide for everyday necessities, these same workers would have to solve the problems of everyday life without awaiting the decisions of the rulers, the latter thus, can now only declare their own uselessness as rulers and blend in with the crowd as workers. Or property will have remained in the hands of proprietors, then, they, holding and disposing of wealth as they please, would remain the true arbiters of social life, and would make sure that the new government composed of socialists, not anarchists, because anarchists do not want to govern nor be governed, will either submit to the wishes of the bourgeoisie or be quickly swept away. I will not dwell on this because I have to go and I don't know when I will be returning. It will be a while before we see each other. Think about what I have said, I hope that when I will return I will find a new comrade. Goodbye to you all. Retrieved on October 9, 15 from Libcom.org Translated by Paul Nesibre with the assistance of Piero Amorato. Edited with an introduction by Paul Nesibre.